Pronto. Hello, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Hello, everyone. Should we start with introduction? Or should we wait for a bit longer? Okay. So hello, hola, hola, everyone. Thank you very much for joining Claric in today's seminar. We want to let you know that following our principle of democratizing the reflections and knowledge developed with Claric, within Claric, our seminars are recorded and later shared on our social media. For those who haven't joined us before, let me briefly introduce our group Claric. Claric stands for the Cambridge Latin American Research and Education Collective, and its founding members are PhD students at the Faculty of Education at the University of Cambridge. CLAREC aims to constitute a space for Latin American perspectives that brings together researchers working on Latin American contexts and all those interested in hearing more about it. It aims to make visible the region's knowledge production and current debates linked to education uh, towards the diversification and decolonization of academia. Today, Claric is delighted to welcome Melissa de Padua, who will be presenting the results of her PhD project regarding the main challenges and opportunities that formative assessment practices face in Chile. Elisa de Padua is an educational psychologist from Chile. In December, in this last December, Elisa passed her PhD viva at the University of Cambridge. So we congratulate her on this huge achievement. Uh, Elisa's career has focused on the assessment on assessment development at the national level and also at the classroom level. She's a founder member of CLARIC and she's currently working as the pedagogical coordinator of the first education research and innovation laboratory for Latin America and the Caribbean, SUMA. She's also the director of FEBE, the Chilean Forum of Professional Working in Educational Assessment. Thank you very much to Elisa for sharing her work with us today. Um, before giving uh, the floor to Elisa, I want to invite our online attendees to please write your questions in the general chat or directly to me. I will collect them and ask them uh, to, to Elisa at the end of her presentation to optimize the time. Elisa, I give the floor to you. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, my curriculum sounds very interesting in English. <laughs> I haven't even, I, I, I haven't heard it before in English, so thank you for that. Um, well, welcome everybody. Uh, today I'm going to present you my research findings of my PhD project. I hope this could be a very informal conversation and we can share our thoughts about assessment. And, but um, I would like the focus to be on how pedagogical practices can help to develop citizens that can deal with uh, an uncertain future. So but you will see why this is a concern for me. <clears throat> well, first of all, I would like to introduce you uh, this group, which is Pevet. Uh, Anna mentioned it. It's a forum of professionals working in assessment in Chile. So it would be very interesting if you can go to our website and you can check. We have lots of videos about assessment in Chile, uh, some articles. Unfortunately, they're only in Spanish, but uh, if you're really interested, you can contact me and I can tell you what it's inside and how can you be part of our group. Well, um, do you recognize this drawing? Yes? Um, do you know the right answer? Okay. A different, sorry? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there in, in, in the Zoom link? 
an opinion about this drawing. Yeah? Okay, well, this drawing is from The Little Prince. And I, I don't know uh, what your experience is, but in, when I was a student in school, these were the most typical questions my teachers asked after reading a book. And I would say that, okay, if you read The Little Prince, um, you can remember that this drawing was in fact a boa constrictor eating an elephant. But uh, for the people who was interpreting this, this drawing, the adults, this was just a hat. The elephant is inside the boa. So it could be any of these answers or none of the above. Maybe that's just a spot in the floor. So um, this type of questions uh, made me think about how important it is to build assessments that can reflect uh, the deep meaning of text. So if you answer, if you, if you in fact answer a boa constrictor, which could be considered as the most correct answer, does it show that you understood the text? That you could uh, share the meaning with the author? That you can explain the text to others? That you enjoy the text? Does, that this text um, change your life in a way? I don't think so. But anyway, these type of questions are the most common, at least in Chilean classrooms. So uh, these were the thoughts that made me uh, choose assessment of one of the main topics for my research. So let me give you some contextual background. Uh, in Chile, we have a strong tradition of standardized and high stakes assessments, which are called the CIMSE tests. Uh, reading lessons um, have a limited participation of students and are focused on reading skills that are associated with localization of information, something that is very explicit, and automatic inferences. So there is no much reflection uh, on the classroom. Uh, using assessment in a formative way is a weakness in teachers' practice according to the National Assessment of Teachers. And there are significant inequalities, not, not only in students' learning outcomes, but also on how teachers uh, are put in schools. So the teachers that had more difficulties to teach their students end up in the classroom where students have more needs. And this, this is a picture of a protest in Chile. Uh, in 2011, students stood up uh, to claim for a better education. And one of their demands were about SIMSE, SIMSE tests. Test. They wanted SIMSE tests to be ended. And they used a quote from the little prince. The essential is invisible to SIMSE. So assessment in Chile is an important thing. Uh, regarding my conceptual background, I try to look at assessment and at reading from two different perspectives. One that it was more focused on individual development and the other that is more focused on society and collaboration. So here you can see two contrasting quotes uh, regarding reading. One from PISA test that defines reading as understanding, using, reflecting on and engaging with written text. And the other one from Freire, which is more focused on how reading can help you to engage with the world and change the world. And this quote is, the act of reading cannot be explored as merely reading words, since every act of reading words implies a previous reading of the world and a subsequent rereading of the world. So here you can see reading more as a social event, a social practice. But assessment can also be looked with these two different perspectives. You can see assessment from the focus on individual development. And here you have a definition. Formative assessment supports teachers and students' inferences about strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities for improvement in learning. 
It's a source of information that educators can use in instructional planning and students can use in deepening their understanding. So everything is focused on individual development. But also you can, you can look at assessment from a situated perspective where the context has more importance. In this quote, the aim of formative assessment in school setting is to develop students' capacity to participate actively in increasingly complex and diversified forms of co-regulation. In other words, to allow students to become increasingly competent co-regulated learners rather than autonomous self-regulated learners. So we have these two perspectives. I don't say that these perspectives are contradictory or that you have to choose one or another. But I think you need to be aware that there are these two different ways to define and to use uh, assessment and also to teach reading. Well, my research question was, what are the challenges and opportunities for teachers' formative assessment practices of reading comprehension in vulnerable classrooms in Chile? And my methodology, um, <clears throat> I perform a qualitative research using multiple case study. I had five cases. Uh, I applied interviews with system stakeholders, which were um, professionals working in teacher training or professionals from the Ministry of Education, teachers and students. I also collect assessment materials. And to analyze my data, I did a thematic analysis and discourse analysis. Well, my findings, oops. Well, here you can see some examples of the assessment materials that I analyzed. And it was very interesting to see that they were very innovative. So uh, that was one of the main findings. I could see that teachers were not applying uh, these multiple choice questions as much as my teachers in school. So that was, that was good to see. So how were these assessment practices? They were innovative, that was good, but they were more focused on assessment formats and less on the inclusion of complex reading comprehension skills or collaborative approaches. So when, in, when the teachers were using these innovative uh, approaches, they were doing it because they wanted to motivate students more than trying to assess complex reading skills. So the skills were focused on a, on a restricted range of reading comprehension skills, summarizing, for example. Grades played a central role. Everything that students were doing in the classroom were graded in a way or another. For example, um, when students were developing a project after reading a book, for example, they had to develop a conceptual map or something. Part of the, the final grade was if the students could leave the room uh, tidy or if they participate, how many times they, they say that they wanted to say something to participate. Uh, so everything in the classrooms were graded. So grades had a main role in motivating students and students uh, perceived that the grades, uh, without grades, it would be very difficult for them to be motivated to read or participate in the classroom. So assessment sometimes were, was more aimed at motivating students than at evaluating their reading comprehension skills. So were these practices formative enough? Because uh, as you could see in the conceptual background, formative assessment is about using the assessment results in order to improve learning. So were these practices formative enough? Um, in general, teachers' assessment practices were aligned with the formative um, principles. So they performed peer assessment, they had clear criteria, 
they use rubrics, uh, but uh, the systematic use of grades, the absence of instances where students uh, could feel empowered as learners or participate in the classroom or in defining um, how they are going to be assessed and the exacer exacerbated focus on skills not related with reading comprehension blurred the formative purpose of formative assessment. Because sometimes teachers were, for example, they, they designed a beautiful assessment strategy where students, for example, had to prepare um, a board game after reading a book. Um, but finally, the criteria to assess this board game was, for example, the instructions. If the instructions were clear enough, if the board game was well designed, uh, if the students participated in, a, in an ordered way, uh, if they respect each other. But written skills were absent in the criteria. So these findings enabled me to distinguish uh, between an instrumental dimension of assessment and an ontological dimension. Uh, with instrumental dimension, I mean, you know the steps, you know what, to need, what you need to do in order to design a formative assessment. You know that and you know it well. But sometimes you get lost uh, regarding the meaning of what you're doing, why you are doing this how you can connect these strategies with the subject, why these strategies can help students to become better at reading, how these strategies can help students to collaborate between them, how these strategies can help students to bring their contextual background <coughs> and give value to their readings considering this background. So teachers were very good at this instrumental dimension, <coughs> but the ontological part was a weakness. Oh, sorry, I haven't been speaking for so long. And a lot of time. I think this is my <coughs> first presentation face to face in like one, two years. <coughs> Well, so I could identify some challenges. The first one was that there was a lack of trust in teachers' professional criteria and the prominence of a traditional approach to assessment. So when I interviewed the stakeholders, <coughs> it was common to hear that they didn't trust in teachers' capacities to implement a formative approach in their classroom. So what they ended up doing is they prepare materials for teachers to apply in their classrooms where teachers judgment don't have, didn't have any role. And even teachers have to sign a contract um, committing themselves uh, in not using the assessment results in ways that were not formative. So they had to sign a contract. So there, were, there was not, not trust in teachers capacities. <coughs> Well, grades uh, were a powerful tool to communicate uh, students' performance and also as a motivational tool. And I asked students, oh, would you like to grades to disappear in your school? When I, I said to my supervisor that I was going to ask this to students, she said, why are you going to ask that? It, it's, Obviously, they're going to say, of course, I don't want grades in my school. But they say, at, at the beginning, I, 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 I made a focus group. At the beginning, they say, of course, I don't want any more grades. But then some students, in, in all the focus group, this happened. Um, one student then say, oh, but if I don't have any grades, I won't be able to know if I am learning. Okay. And then the other, oh, but if I don't have any grades, that would be unfair because I will study, I will make my best effort, but maybe a classmate, she, he will not uh, study, he will not uh, make any effort to learn and 
we will go to the next level, to the next year level anyway. <coughs> and that could be unfair. So at the end of the conversation, students agreed that it's a good idea to have grades because otherwise they will, know, they will not know if they're learning, they will not feel motivated to learn. And another challenge is that teachers face a, a dilemma. They recognize seems the test as insufficient to assess their students, but they do not find their, their appropriate support to transform their practices. So uh, teachers, they know, they know they have to change their assessment strategies. But when they try to, when they looked at the support that is given by the Ministry of Education, what they find is mistrust. They don't find support. And well, seems the tests have high consequences on schools. So they need to perform well in these tests. So to do that, they try to camouflage their assessment strategies, like survivors. One of the teachers used this concept, survivors. They're trying to survive the system by camouflaging their assessment strategies in a seems like uh, form. So maybe it's not that, as the stakeholder said, it's not maybe that teachers don't know how to assess their students, it's maybe that they are afraid of assessment and they try to make their best in order to survive in this system. <coughs> but I also found some opportunities. Teachers uh, value the formative approach. They, know, they knew this was uh, relevant. They tried to uh, do their best in order to apply this formative assessment. They knew the characteristics of formative assessment. Uh, so that was an opportunity that needed to be taken uh, in order to support better um, the, the teachers. Teachers try to innovate. They uh, use their time to design more innovative assessment practices. Uh, but as I said before, they lack of support. I also found some examples of practices that present the logic of right and wrong answer and where a student's background was valued and the, the interactions between students were also valued and were considered part of learning. And that was very, very interesting to find. And I have a quote from a teacher that I would like to read. Mm. And she said, I do not believe only in this kind of annotations that one makes in the middle of the process, only with a student, with one student. I believe that this contributes a lot to the individualism of the children and competition between them. So I think that addressing it collectively helps a lot. So it was very interesting to find that some teachers could apply a more uh, social cultural approach to reading and also to assessment where learning was constructed between the student, not only in an individual uh, way. And finally, uh, there was a positive value given to assessment strategies that require collaboration. And this could be found in, in teachers, but also in students. It was great to see students, very, very little children, uh, saying that it was great working with others because they could help each other and they could learn about the world that their classmates were living in. So that was very interesting to find. So I think um, this, this finding, uh, it's very interesting for me because I think assessment, even if it can be perceived as a very technical thing, can have an impact on how you uh, develop citizens that are able to live in a world that is changing, that is very demanding, that is affected by the climate crisis. Uh, well, now we have uh, our peace threatened, uh, democracy has been damaged, we have fake news. So I think even that assessment can be seen as something very technical, assessment can have a place in developing uh, more collaborative, creative uh, children. And it was great to see that some of these teachers could 
show some practices that were uh, leading in that direction. So I would like to end with this quote from Maria Montessori. Everyone talks about peace, but no one educates for peace. In this world, they educate for competition and competition is the beginning of any war. When educating to cooperate and owe each other solidarity, that day will be educating for peace. And I think assessment as any more other pedagogical strategies uh, can be considered as a tool for educating for peace. So I have this question for you. How do you think pedagogical practices can prepare students to live in a world where democracy, peace, and the planet are threatened? Um, well, thank you very much. I will leave this question for you in case you want to answer or if you have some questions for me. Thank you very much, Elisa. Are there any questions here uh, on our online environment? If you want to write those on the chat. Or a contribution to answer to Elisa's question. Having. Yes, thank you, Elisa, for your presentation. It was very interesting. I am also a Chilean, so it made me understand a lot of uh, processes and way of thinking of teachers and, and classrooms uh, that, that are new to me. So thank you very much for that. Um, I, I have a question, a question that um, relates to the research process. And maybe it'd be helpful for other of the young researchers participating here in this seminar or, or elsewhere. And it's because you were studying something that like assessment, and even though it is formative assessment, you said that this is something that it's closely monitored by the school. Uh, so as a researcher, your process of accessing the information how was it for you? Do you did you find it easy to delve in these topics with the participants? Would you give some recommendations to other researchers focusing in these types of topics that are mandatory within the school structures? Hmm. Well, the first thing I will say is be prepared to have a plan B. <clears throat> because um, my initial, my initial uh, methodology changed a lot because of the pandemic and also because there, were, uh, there was a, a long, very long strike of teachers in Chile um, before I did my field work. So I, I planned to spend like a week in each school, but the schools were very reluctant because they, they need to uh, give all the time for students inside the classroom without any, losing any second. So I had to change my, my research methods. Um, so I planned, for example, I was planning to video record the lessons and then select uh, some parts of the lesson and interview the teachers again, showing them some, some of these sections. But in the end, I just audio record the session. I spent like half an hour uh, selecting some of the audios and the same day I interviewed the teacher again. So um, I think you need to be very flexible, um, but always thinking about uh, how, how to gather the data that you really need. Uh, and it was very interesting to collect not also interviews, but also the assessment materials. Um, so that way I could triangulate what teachers were saying with what teachers were doing. So I think it, it's a good idea to have different sources of information 
uh, regarding the same phenomena that you are uh, studying. I don't know if that answered your question. Oh, it's so strange because I, if you, if I look this way, I know you think I am seeing at you, but to see you, I have to look that way. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, uh, Elisa. Vina has a comment or a question as well. Yes, hi, Elisa, and thank you very much for sharing and congratulations for, for this achievement. I think it's it's quite interesting and what you're saying is very helpful for us that are on, on, on this process. So I wanted to ask you a little bit if you could extend a little bit more on your participants. So you said you, have, you had five case studies, but this meant five classrooms or five schools or, or and how did you decide on who to, to include? Yeah, yeah, I went very fast on that part. Uh, well, my cases were five teachers and I selected these teachers uh, because through different sources, uh, I could found these teachers to be very <clears throat> good at formative assessment. So. Um, I interviewed first the system stakeholders who were working in the Ministry of Education or in teacher training institutions, and they led me to these teachers. They said, okay, I know these teachers. I end up with a list of like 50 teachers, and then I looked at some of these assessment practices of these teachers, and then I select the final five teachers with their students. So, and the criteria was um, that I could find teachers that were applying this formative assessment approach in their classrooms. I have just another follow-up question. And, and was it easy to explain like to the system people, as you were saying, uh, what you meant with formative assessment? Were there uh, different conceptions of what formative assessment? Because I understand that uh, there's not, well, in, in Mexico at least, or in my context, it's not such a distinction between, it's difficult to, to say formative or summative. Sometimes it's, uh, they just call it exams or evaluation. Um, well, I think in Chile, they, they know uh, the concept. Uh, when you say formative assessment, people think about, about something. I don't know if they think about the same thing, but they know formative assessment, for example, uh, seems the tests are not formative. They will agree on that. And sometimes maybe they say, okay, summative assessment is when you uh, students get a grade at the end and that's summative. But I didn't find um, any difficulties in, in, in explaining this or nobody said, okay, uh, oh, what are you talking about? What is this? Uh, they, we could understand each other using this, this concept. Thank you. I was going to ask, how did you choose or why only five? Like, because I'm just starting, so like, what do you expect for your sample? I have no idea. <laughs> so so many people say that it has to be five, six, ten. How do you choose them? Yeah, well, I was very happy when I found in one one book about uh, multiple case studies um, that it, it has a number, a magic number. <laughs> and sometimes it's difficult to find, but this guy, Stake is her name. Uh, he said, okay, maybe four is too little and more than 10 is too much. I thought, oh, that's good. So at the, at the beginning, I aimed at uh, having 10 teachers. because I thought I, I, I would like to have different experiences to look at different experiences. But uh, in the end, it, it wasn't possible because, because of the strikes, uh, some teachers said, oh, sorry, I don't have the time to do this. Um, so I end up with five because those were the five that wanted to do this. Here in the chat, we have another comment. Uh, Andy Smart um, asks, or well, says, that he would be interested in your teacher's thoughts on the question that you uh, mentioned. 
I don't know if you had the opportunity to talk about these topics with your teachers um, and you would like to share something about that, Elisa. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure if I, I, got, I got the question right. If I discuss uh, the, the question, uh, how do you think pedagogical practices can prepare students to live in a world where democracy, peace, and the planet are threatened? Oh, you yeah, know, I, I think we we didn't have the chance to discuss this with teachers, but uh, I think uh, I think it's super interesting or very important to discuss this in any instance that you can share with teachers because. Uh, when you are teaching something, you're not just teaching maths or teaching science or teaching about photosynthesis or whatever. Uh, you are uh, developing a citizen. So you need to have in mind that uh, there is an underlying discourse that is affecting students. And the way you conceive learning um, and pedagog pedagogy um, it's affecting how students learn and how they relate, relate with each other. So um, I didn't have the chance to discuss this with teachers, but uh, one of the things that I had to cancel because of the pandemic was a second opportunity to be with the teacher. And I'm still planning to do that. Uh, so I think this would be definitely a topic to discuss with them. Elisa, can I ask a question? I'd be really interested, uh, I know this is horrible when you pass your PhD, but then people say, what are you going to do next? But I am genuinely interested, like for your future moving forward in your career, has it affected uh, the way you think or what, how you might practice from now on? Um, well, I think uh, while I was doing my, my research, I, in, in, a, in, in a parallel world, <laughs> I was very concerned about the climate crisis, but this world were parallel. And, but in the end, I thought this thing about collaborative learning has something to do with fighting the, the climate crisis. So I started making some links. So I, I would love to explore more in that way and how assessment in particular can contribute uh, to to develop citizens that are more aware of uh, our impact in the world. So I think that is something I, I would love to explore. Um, and that, that's it. That's fantastic. No, no. Elisa, that sounds like you're going to have to do another PhD. You're going to have to do your doctor doctor. <laughs> no, 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 no. Maybe, maybe in the streets, Julia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Right. So did you, in your findings, find any major differences between the way that you think those two groups, the way they thought the assessment, and the major differences, or they were pretty much aligned on the way they saw the assessment? Um, so can you reframe the question to the people on the, um, they, they didn't get the question. Oh, oh. Um, I received a question about if I found some differences be between students that were from primary and secondary school. Um, well, the differences, um, I think they were more related with, with their cognitive development because uh, little children were not so able to uh, develop their answers a little bit more. Uh, but it was very interesting to see that some elements were uh, very similar. <laughs> For example, the collabor how they value collaborative, collaborative work and the role of grades for small children, it was, it was super important as well as for um, elder uh, students. So, um, and another difference was that, um, but, well, that, this is more uh, specific to reading. Uh, so elder students could uh, identify in a more clear way the, the reading skills that were assessed by the teachers. 
but younger students, uh, they offer more general responses. It wasn't very clear for them if they were being assessed uh, by their drawings or their capacity to uh, summarize the text. So those were the differences. I have another question. Uh, it's just that I think that this topic, we can discuss it so much. And I wonder, because of course you studied in a specific context that is Chile, um, Chilean, I don't know if you studied only public schools, or, but, or also private, but I wonder if you could make some reflection about to what extent your results may apply to other contexts as well? Would, would you say that your findings are very context specific of the Chilean reality? Or did you find any rationales or logic that you think may be of use to understand formative assessment practices in other educational systems too? Um. Well, I think this distinction between a more instrumental approach and a more ontological approach to assessment is something that can be useful for different contexts. Um, and also, I think that uh, in particular, there was one teacher that was very, very good uh, in developing collaborative uh, assessment strategies and in um, motivating students to really, really reflect on, on the text and the connections with their backgrounds. So I think um, in the, the first, um, this, this distinction between instrumental and ontological approach to assessment could be one thing, something more general, but the examples I could find in my research, I think they are also very useful to see that even teachers that are working in very, very, very socioeconomic vulnerable school uh, can apply uh, interesting strategies that can help students to reflect and become better at reading and better at collaborating. Thank you. I wanted to, because you mentioned the age of the children, and yeah, at some point it's easier for you to ask them questions and decide, do you have an age? Like that you say, yeah, children who are older than this, it's easier to, mm. to work. Well, at the beginning, I was interested in selecting teachers that were working in the grades where the SIMSA tests uh, were applied more intensively, because I thought, it could be interesting to see how they deal with the pressure of SIMSA tests and the formative approach. But um, it was very difficult to find teachers that uh, could show some evidence of formative assessment. So, um, ah, and, and, and first I was trying to uh, choose teachers from primary education. But uh, then I had to decide, would I open this restriction? of the age of students. Um, so I can have teachers that uh, are show an interesting approach to formative assessment or should I keep with this age of students? So at the end, I decided to have teachers from primary and secondary, but it was just something uh, practical because I couldn't find so many examples. And I found a teacher that was very, very good, uh, but he, she was in secondary education. And I thought, I will lose this teacher. So at the end, I decided to have a, a broad uh, age range for students. Yes, of course. I'm not part of your research, but I'm curious to understand. So they being assessed for reading. Uh, how could the teachers um, help those students, um, if, if the ones with some privileged backgrounds, if they don't have access to books, for example, or 
that the that read books at home with that. Those schools, do they have any programs for, for improved literacy or to improve reading skills for those uh, who fall behind? Well, all of the schools that were in my research uh, were uh, were working with students from a low socioeconomic socioeconomic background. So, um, and, and that was a question for students. And most of them, they bought they bought their books. And some of them, they they went to the public library to get the books. But uh, except for one teacher. Um, the students had to get the books by themselves. And that was uh, very disappointing to see. Um, the, the, the teacher that, um, this other teacher, she tried to use the books that were provided by the Ministry of Education so the students didn't have to buy any books. But in most cases, uh, that was not happening. And uh, <clears throat> there was one, one of the teachers reflected on <laughs> that sometimes families could be an obstacle for developing good readers because they had to buy these books. Um, and she remembered about one of the parents say, now you have transformed my kid in a, um, how do you say in English, like a warm book, <laughs> warm book. Yeah, is that, is that correct? Warm book? Bookborn. Bookborn. <laughs> um, and now he's asking me to buy more books and I don't have the money to buy the books. And he was very, very angry. So it's, it's a thing, the access to books, uh, it's not so easy. And the schools, they don't have libraries. They have libraries, but not enough books for each student. And well, the, the students that were more motivated, they went to the public library and, and lots of them, they also used uh, some apps to download books, but they say, oh, but I don't like that very much because sometimes the WhatsApp is popping and Instagram. And <laughs> so that was an issue. There's a question about that at the uh, chat. Anna says, primary age students had to buy their, their own books. Schools do not supply books. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, the Ministry of Education, they, they give books to students. They have uh, this, the class books that are free for all students. Uh, but schools uh, can freely choose uh, students to read that. They say the complementary a uh, reading plan so they can select the other books for students to read and students have to buy these books. In some schools there are big libraries but normally there are not uh, enough, enough books for each student. So that's an issue. Um, so yes, sometimes they have to buy their own books and some of the students they bought the books uh, secondhand uh, in the market um, but in the students that I could be with, uh, most of them, they bought their, their own books. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting, the, the five teachers, the five teachers that you studied, and did they ask you for a feedback on their practice, or did you go back and share with them what they were missing and, um, yes, um, well, they asked me uh, for some feedback about their practices, and that was supposed to be the second part of my research. Uh, but because of the pandemic, I couldn't go back to Chile and perform the second part. So that is something I plan to do now. So yes, but I think that it would be super interesting for them to know each other because uh, I think they had very great ideas about how to assess their students and the challenges they were facing. So I think just to uh, put them together, putting them together in a group, that would be so interesting for them, even if I'm silent. <laughs> Maybe you can put them together like in a digital platform or something. 
Yes, yes, I was planning to do that because uh, I was planning to, um, to do a, a small seminar in April 2020, yeah. So then I thought, oh, maybe I could do this, this uh, online, but teachers were under a lot of pressure during mm -hmm. the pandemic. So uh, the first time I asked, two of them said, oh, yes, yes, I would love to do that. But the other three said, oh, let me see. So I decided I will leave this when <clears throat> schools are back to normal. So I think now it could be a good time to do it. Here in the chat is some, oh, sorry, go ahead uh, there and then I'll ask it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, so my question was um, about, so you mentioned the practices that some of the teachers and then also some of the teachers feedback. Uh, I want to know how you uh, evaluated which ones were good, like what was the criteria to be a good either practice and also outcome as well, like what was considered successful delivery? Sorry, how how they? So you're saying that some of the strategies were good. Mm -hmm. um, The first part is about uh, which criteria I use to um, identify good practices, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, well, regarding that, um, I followed uh, William's um, description of the dimensions of formative assessment. So they have to use uh, uh, shared criteria, peer assessment, um, formative uh, feedback. There were two more. Uh, students uh, should feel empowered of their learning. Um, there is another one I can't remember. <clears throat> so I tried to look at this criteria, but also <clears throat> I wanted to look at what assessment, what written skills were being assessed in these uh, strategies. Um, and that was very, um, it was common to see that most of the assessment strategies were focused on either things that were not related with reading comprehension, like handwriting or how do you participate in the classroom. And when reading skills were considered, it was more about uh, summarizing information or very, um, very simple inferences. So when I say that a strategy was successful, it combined uh, assessing a broad range of reading skills and also uh, um, achieving this criteria defined uh, by William for formative assessment. And the other part of the well, question? Well, I was going to go to the same thing, but I was about when you, you mentioned that you were like saying teachers and so forth, uh, they could take a few readers. Uh -huh. uh, and I was just interested in how that was like, you rate that in their exam results or how that was compared. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, I, I didn't look at uh, students reading skills. So I, I, I don't know if they were developing their reading skills or not, because I didn't apply any tests or anything. So that it was more about um, inferring that if you are given the, giving the opportunity to, stu to students to uh, show how good readers they are, then you can think that maybe they are developing good readers, but I couldn't check. Mm -hmm. Just one more thing here, going back to the question about the books and the schools not supplying books. Um, Andy Smart says, um, it, uh, he wonders if this is a difference between course books and story informational books. So if some of them are supplied by schools and the other ones the children have to buy for themselves were the parents. Um, if the difference is between course books, uh, which we assume school will supply, and story books or informational books, 
for the, the Ministry of Education um, gives to schools these two types of books, the course books and also books for the library, which can be um, informative texts or um, storybooks or novels or whatever. The thing is, uh, normally there are not enough books for each student. Uh, some, some teachers, um, for example, there was one teacher that knowing this, uh, she chose, for example, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde as a book to read with the students. And she knew that there weren't enough copies of the same book, but she knew that there were, this book was also in, as a comic book. So she managed to have half of the course reading the comic book and the other half reading the, the novel. So it was, a, it was a good strategy to deal with the lack of books in school. So students didn't have to buy any books. So I don't know if that was the question. I think it was. Okay, so we are approaching the end, but we have one last question. I don't know if we'll have the time, but I will just read it out loud to you. Um, it says, oh, so can you see the chat over there? I don't know. Yes, yes. <laughs> but it says, you say that the grading was focused in things not relating directly on reading comprehension. Were these grades given as a grade for reading comprehension in a report card, or were these used to use reading in other contexts? What I mean is we have all sorts of activities in literature teaching that resemble what you describe, but they are not the grade given for reading comprehension. There we have an exam that focuses only on that. Well, in Chile, uh, grades uh, are needed for students to be promoted to the next year level. So that's the, con the consequence of grades. So, uh, um, for example, uh, students had to prepare a leaflet about a book, and the leaflet had different criteria. One was um, the student could summarize the story, for example. But the other five was where um, uh, I don't know, the leaflet was creative. Uh, it was uh, the handwriting was fine. It was uh, delivered on time, um, something like that. So at the end, the teacher could say, OK, this is a very good leaflet. So it would have a seven. Seven is the highest grade. And that grade goes to the, um, the student report. And you can, and then you will have, a, I don't know, five grades or seven or 10 during the year. And uh, the mean of those grades uh, can be used to decide if the student could go to the next year level or not. So uh, it's not that you have a great special, a great, a special grade for handwriting, but it's embedded in the in the grade that is for the whole project or the leaflet or the or the test. I don't know if that answers Anna's question. I think it does. Okay, so thank you very much uh, to Elisa for a fantastic session on the main challenges and opportunities that formative assessment practices face in Chile. And thank you to our attendees for your attention and for full questions. We hope you enjoyed the seminar as much as we did. Uh, before we conclude the session, we want to invite you to our next event, which will take place next Monday, Monday 7th at 2 p.m. UK time in which Ana Maria Fiorentino will present her work titled Mothers and Daughters Intertwined Memories, Healing Trauma and the Rupture with Paid Domestic Work in Brazil. So uh, join us if you can. Uh, do not forget also to follow Clark's social media to keep informed about these and the future events that we are planning for you. Uh, this was all for today's seminar. Thank you very much to everyone. And we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.